Well, thanks for joining tonight, everyone. Uh, it's nice to get back to the webinar series. It was great to see many of you at our cattle industry convention a few weeks back, but we're back on uh, online with the webinar series. Um, my name's Josh White. I lead the producer education and sustainability team here at NCBA. Um, it's my pleasure to host the webinar tonight. If you've uh, never attended one of these before, we'll go over a few ground rules here for you. Uh, everyone is muted. Um, we've got well over 100 folks attending tonight, and if we didn't mute all the lines, uh, you wouldn't hear any of the presenters. So you're going to be muted as a participant, but uh, we do have a chat function and a question function, so you can use either one of those in the toolbar that should have appeared on your screen as you're uh, logging in, and you can chat in your questions, and we'll try to remind you of that at the end as well. But keep those questions coming all through the webinar, and I'll moderate those to our panelists uh, at the end of the presentation. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. We'll get rolling right quickly here. Oh, sorry, you all didn't really care to see me anyway. So uh, Tom Jones joins us tonight from Central Kansas. We've got several folks in Kansas tonight, but Tom uh, raised in Southwest Kansas, uh, many of you may recognize the name coming out of convention. He was recently inducted into the uh, Cattle Feeders Hall of Fame. So congratulations, Tom. Uh, Tom uh, is a managing partner at High Plains Feed Yard and has been for a couple of decades now. And they've, if you, if you haven't heard of High Plains before, I would encourage you to check them out. They've got a nice website that explains what they do. Um, but they do a lot of research. They're set up uh, with grow safe systems and other technology to help uh, conduct commercial, you know, feed yard, real world level research. And they also commercially feed a lot of cattle, just like a regular feed yard. Uh, doing a great job with that as well, of course. Uh, they have a education and research center that they opened in 2017 so that they can not only get some research done there, they can host groups and talk about the research. And uh, I've had the pleasure of attending a uh, function there and it's it's very nice and and they do a great job hosting events uh, if you're ever looking for a place um, to host an event out in that area and, and feed yard focused it's i'm sure tom would love to talk to you about that um, tom's very passionate about the cattle industry he's been very engaged in in some tough conversations around sustainability and how we can get better every day and uh He's been a real leader in this uh, beef on dairy data collection, understanding the genetics and performance of these cattle, working with a number of partners that he'll describe here shortly. Uh, one of those partners is uh, Greg Bethard, uh, CEO at High Plains Ponderosa Dairy. Uh, Greg has uh, received education all around the country from uh, New Mexico State all the way back to North Carolina State, Virginia Tech. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge on the dairy business. He was a dairy consultant, worked uh, in the corporate world on, on dairy uh, for a while, and then um, joined as a partner in High Plains Ponderosa Dairy uh, back in 2017. And um, he's well published, and I think we'll learn a lot from him. They keep a lot of data uh, on their beef dairy cross uh, projects there, and, and they've been involved in research with Tom, uh, carrying those cattle on through the feed yard. So Looking forward to hearing some some great real world information from these guys. And then Blake Foraker is a PhD candidate at meat, uh, in meat science at Texas Tech University. Um, he also partnered in a project with these folks looking at the cattle going through the feed yard and all the way through the packing plant to understand the meat characteristics uh, that we're seeing in these beef and dairy uh, crosses. He uh, obtained his bachelor's in animal science from K-State, got a master's in meat science at Colorado State, and again, he's working on his PhD uh, there at Texas Tech, and he'll be presenting some of that research, as I mentioned. Uh, he's set to graduate here pretty soon this spring, so this is uh, a great opportunity for Blake to share his, his research. And then Dr. Dale Warner, you see his picture there. He is a uh, professor uh, there at Texas Tech in the... Um, Food and Animal Sciences Department, working with Blake on this research, and he'll be around to help us answer questions, and he's also a wealth of knowledge beyond just the research Blake will talk about, but uh, understanding uh, 
just a wide array, array of uh, meat science implications of this crossbreeding uh, trend that we've seen. And, and the title, of course, is about hits and misses. So hopefully we'll hear not only the successes, but some of the real world challenges that these guys have, um, have encountered. So with that, Tom, I'm going to hand the uh, controls over to you. Very good. Okay. Well, thanks for the kind words, Josh. Those are, that's, that's great. Uh, I, I love hearing that from you and really appreciate all, all the nice things you said. And, you know, it's a, uh, the, the panelists or the people that are on this thing today, I can't, I can't say enough about them. I, I've worked with them for several years now. And um, I, every time they show up or every time I go to their house, I, I, we take a look and I, and I just can't believe what we learn. And, uh, and, and, and you talk about hits and misses. If we hadn't have joined up with these people years ago, we we would still be we'd, we'd still be in trouble. High Plains would still be in trouble with our program. We started in 2015 on these composites, and and uh, our misses were uh, uh, we were ranging anywhere from 60 to 100 percent choice on our cattle, and just all over the place. And we we're making zero progress as far as phenotype, as far as putting more muscle in the cattle. So. Uh, as cowboys, we finally figured out that we weren't geneticists, and and then we we went ahead and and uh, got involved with ABS. But if you look across the look across the screen, we, you know, uh, uh, it tells a little bit about ourselves and, and about the people that are playing with this in, in in this thing. And we can't forget Cargill as well because Cargill has 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 been just tremendous uh, with us being able to go in there and, and pull data, and, and they've been a great partner in this thing from from day. From day one, from 2015, Cargill was with us trying to help make this thing work. But all these cattle, uh, you know, we're we're uh, we're doing uh, grow safe nodes on these cattle. We're testing feed efficiency on bulls uh, that we're using for the program, and we're also doing it on progeny of the cattle as well. The second slide is is uh, it says carbon footprint, but that's a green feed machine. So and those are composites in there, and. Uh, uh, we have these green. Uh, we have the green feed machine. That one set up in in a grow safe pen as well. So not alone as we're not all we're just checking uh, just uh, uh, feed efficiency, but we're also looking at methane emissions as well. And uh, we use ABS for real world data, uh, guys. We were making very little progress till we brought them on, and uh, and they they really accelerated what we were getting done. This genetic genetic selection is is real, and uh, they they. The, we really hit the accelerator when uh, when they came in and, and 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 started finding out what we were doing. And as we collected more data through this thing, uh, it, it really the more data you have, the more useful it is. More tools you have to manage. And we've had a group of cattle here just here in the last few weeks where we we've had uh, we've had uh, uh, some quality grade that slipped down just a couple points, and we're wondering why, as consistent as these cattle are, what was going on there. Well, we identified a bull that that, uh, that didn't fit the specs, not project not fitting the specs, so it's just great to get be able to pull that thing out of the system and, and, and move on. Uh, Texas Tech, uh, got, you know, every time these kids come out here and, and Dale brings them out and, and 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 uh, and Blake's with them. I, I learned something from them. And it's just a, it's a wonderful deal. If you guys ever get a chance to spend some time with them, do it. And of course, we can't we can we we were making progress also with having uh, uh, Max Garrison on board as well with us uh, to try and help us uh, you know define some of these phenotypic aspects of, of, of what we're looking for. And I'll try to get this thing to move. So. In 21, 2021, we shipped out 60 head of cattle, and uh, and uh, and I'll have to apologize. They're got, they're not as good as Bethard's cattle. I'll tell you that right now. When when he'll 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 tell you his numbers are going to be huge. They're be they're, they're great. Most progressive dairy we've got. We're working with. So what we shipped out a little over 4,000 head of cattle. Our death loss was two percent, running right within industry averages. Treaty percentage is 2.7 percent. I think that, that's that industry averages are for that quality of cattle, but a little bit below probably. Retreated six tenths of one percent. Um, so that's that's a that's a bonus for us. So, you know, if you look at labor and and antimicrobials and and all of all of things like that, when it uh, you know, we whether you look at the retail side of it and uh, for antimicrobial use or just the labor and the dollars that it takes, you know, to to um, compare these to uh, high risk cattle or moderate risk cattle. Uh, initial in weight on cattle, 669 pounds. And uh, we're taking them up to 1,450 pounds going out. And uh, that's a shrunk weight, of course. Uh, we're averaging 234 days on feed. Our uh, average daily gain is 321 on the cattle. 
and our feed conversion is 681. And uh, it, uh, the feed conversion, you know, we're not proud of that. Um, they're better than than just a straight dairy animal, but uh, uh, you know, we're we're still working on trying to get that down. Um, also, CAB percentage is about 41%. Uh, we're getting them to yield 62.6%. Uh, choice or better, 91.5%. And uh, this is one that uh, probably get barked at just a little bit. USCO grade threes are better, is 76.4%. We're targeting 15 to 18% yield grade fours on getting these cattle out. We feel that we're pushing. Um, we're pushing a, a number of cattle into the prime range when when we put a little bit more fat on the cattle. And as long as that spread stays wide, we're going to keep doing that. And if that, it, then you know, we that choice spread narrowing down now. Prime's kind of hanging in there. But you know, if we if we lose that prime and, and the choice spread gets any lower than it is now, why we'll cut the days back on these cattle. Our our, our, our hot carcass weights 899 pounds, 12 12 rib fat thickness is is 0.58 and a 13.84 uh, square inch ribeye and a marbling score of 552 and a half. That's kind of the that's kind of that's kind of what we've done at the feed yard and it's and it's from from 2015 to 2022 we've made progress from averaging probably 65 70% uh, up to 91 and a half percent where feed efficiency is getting just a little bit better. Uh, it's going to take us a little bit more time to really get that under control. But uh, I feel we've made good progress, uh, uh, and, and we couldn't have done it, of course, without all, all those partners that uh, you, you're going to be able to listen to here in just a minute. Um, well, thanks, Tom. I, I appreciate the, the handoff. And, and as Tom mentioned, we, we've had a really outstanding partnership. And you know, I think one of the take-homes you see here on, on the screen is added value through great partnerships. You know, for us, it was really critical to, to get involved with uh, a good partners all the way through so we can produce the kind of product we want. Um, I apologize for not having any slides, kind of find, found out about this last minute and didn't really have a chance to put slides together. I'll go through some of our data and talk a little bit about what we do. Um, we're, we're dairymen, of course, not, not cattlemen. And, you know, the feed yard thing to me is new. Some of my partners are, have a, a beef background and understand a little better, but this is kind of a new venture for us. And we got into it um, like most dairies did because dairy bull calves really weren't worth much of anything and the crossbred ones were really worth almost nothing. And, and our herd, as you can see in the picture there, are crossbred Holstein Jersey crosses are our foundation. So uh, kind of hard to get rid of those calves and looking for another revenue source. So we got into the beef thing. Uh, sex semen has become uh, much more um, repeatable and the results are good enough that we, a couple of years ago, decided, you know, we're gonna change our entire breeding program to use sex semen to create the number of replacements we need every week and then everything else will be beef semen. So right now, you know, we're generating 1,000 to 1,200 a month born. Um, you know, roughly 60% of our calves are, are beef right now. And uh, the programs work well for us. The thing that as a dairyman, I'm kind of accustomed to getting a milk check every month. So this has been kind of difficult that when we first started this project a few years ago, you know, we bought our first semen and started breeding cows. Well, golly, it's a long time before we got any money out of the deal. So I, I have a lot of sympathy for all you beef guys that wait a long time for your checks. The dairy business is kind of nice that way we get them every month. Um, so, uh, what our goals in this long term have been, you know, getting into, it, we, we wanted to get a partner like Tom that, that we could work with that had similarly lined values. We were after creating a consistent supply um, and differentiating ourselves in a way that would create market access, not necessarily premiums per se, but market access. You know, we're, we're putting a digester in. Tom mentioned carbon, low carbon footprint. We're, we're trying to do those same kinds of things. Um, we're, of course, agent source verified. You know, we've got computerized records on every animal. So we know where that animal was every day of its life, every treatment it's ever had. So we've got, you know, a good history on all the animals, the low carbon footprint and the consistent supply. Obviously, as a dairy, we're breeding cows every day out of the year. So we really should have a consistent supply year round of the same kind of animals. And there really should be fairly small seasonal effects. So that's kind of why we got into it and uh, um, what we're after. We've been really happy with the performance of our animals. I really don't know what to compare it to because this whole beef thing to me is new. So forgive my ignorance. And when I talk through some of the numbers, I don't uh, really understand a lot of what we're looking at. I'm learning, um, but I've been pleased 
financially, we've been pleased. You know, our cattle have consistently made money for us. And obviously that's the whole reason for doing this. So we're satisfied with that. And we're looking to grow as we grow our dairy, we intend to grow the beef program with it. It's really worked out well for us. So um, I think the genetic component is, is, is important. Um, we're with ABS with their in-focus program. I don't really have a lot else to compare to because that's basically all we've used and they, they've done really well. So we've not had calving, we've not had calving problems at the dairy. Conception rates have been fine all that, from the dairy side of it. Everything's been great. And then the performance of the animals, I really didn't know how ours compared to everybody else. It's really great to hear Tom say our, our cattle are doing well compared to others. Um, so our program basically is that the animals are born on our dairy day one. We ship them off to a calf ranch down in Texas, Deer Creek Feeders, and they raise them till about 150 days. And then we bring them back to the dairy and we feed them, put them on feed, and we put them on what I consider a feed yard style diet. You know, we work with Tom's nutritionist to, to feed a diet that, that he was comfortable with. And from a dairy side, it's a much more higher, higher energy ration than we would feed to our heifers. So we've got a totally separate program for the beef animals. And they go on that until eight, 900 pounds, somewhere around there, seven, eight, 900 pounds is when we've mostly been shipping them to Tom. But you'll see when I get into our days on feed data, we've had to send some to Tom at three, 400 pounds too. Cause we, at different times as we're growing, we've run out of pen space and have had to ship them up sooner. So we've kind of been all over the board and, and when we've sent to them. Um, but what we've had here at the dairy, we, we implant them when we get them back from the camp, calf ranch at 150 days, a compu dose. It's about a 200 day implant. And we keep them here roughly 200 days, maybe a little bit less. We've been gaining about 3.1, 3.2 pounds a day gain here at the dairy. Um, so again, for me, from a, from a traditionally looking at dairy heifers, that strikes me as pretty good. Um, that may not be great in the beef world, but um, I look at the animals and man, they, they really are growing and they certainly don't look like dairy animals. It's amazing to watch these animals change. We've had a lot of cattle and come to our dairy and look at our beef animals and be shocked at what they're seeing because that's not what they expected. Most people think they're going to see something very dairy looking and very different and, and ours, in my opinion, look like beef. So we've, we've harvested about 4,000 head, four to, four to 5,000 head somewhere in there total over the last year and a half, and the majority of them uh, through, through Tom's yard. Um, we've averaged uh, through all of those about 292 days on feed. You know, we've had a big range, you know, uh, down as low as uh, below 200 on some and, and, and up over 300 on some, again, based on the days, the time we send them to the feed yard. Um, we've averaged 1,455 pounds uh, pay weight, that's after the 4% shrink, as, as Tom has mentioned. Um, and uh, the difference between heifers and steers, our steers have averaged 1496 and our heifers have averaged 1432. And, and they've had identical days on feed between the two. Now, what we're doing, we're whenever I get a grid back, and I didn't know what grids, I, I mean, I was so, so ignorant, I didn't even know what a grid was. So we first got the grids back, you know, I just looked at it from a data standpoint, like, gee, I want to get all this data recorded and I want to us to develop a model that we can predict when's the best time to harvest these animals, what type of management strategies result in us getting the most margin. So we're trying to generate basically an algorithm depending on the packer that can have a constant steady state comparative of performance. You know, we do that on our dairy side, take market conditions out of the equation and really predict, okay, which cattle are really performing better economically. So that's what we're striving to do. And that's the, the really reason for getting all this data so we can hopefully make better decisions. Um, premiums across all of them we sold, you know, again, premiums change a lot over time. So this is not standardized, just the actual premium received. We've, we've averaged $18 premium across everything per head. And our heifers, we've averaged 40, about 40 couple dollars, and we've averaged about 50 cents on our steers. So, you know, generally our heifers are grading a little better, a little better premium, but you're selling less pounds. So we're actually making more money on the steers and they convert feed a little better, but we're, uh, we get actually get better premiums on the heifers. Um, I don't know if that's what you all see on the beef side or not. Again, I've got no other beef data to compare this to, so I don't know really what's good or bad. Um, we've averaged 2.9% death loss across everything. Again, consider those longer days on feed, 3.9 uh, pounds, and I'm sorry, that's not right. Uh, average daily gain, I think we're about 3.4 pounds of average daily gain across everything. Um, our yield is 62.6%. That's a weak point to me because I look at our, our premiums, I'll go through here in a minute, we're getting hammered on yield from the packers. And that's by far our biggest feed up that we get on a grid. 
Um, and I understand beef animals are a point or so higher than that, but we've been pretty consistent along that way. Our, our steers have been 62.3 and the heifers have been 63.3. So again, our heifers have yielded a little bit better than the steers. Um, our certified Angus beef has been right around 40% uh, across both groups. Um, our dry matter conversions with deads out has been about six and a half. Um, we're running 94% choice and prime. Um, of that 69% uh, choice, 25% prime, and 6% select. Um, our heifers run a little bit higher prime and choice. We're running about 98% on the heifers versus 93% on the steers. And uh, the, the actual prime, we're running almost 40% on the heifers prime, which apparently is a pretty good number. Again, I, I can't talk from comparing to anybody else. Um, our yield grades, uh, our yield grade fives, we're running about 6%. And our yield grade fours, we're running 24. Um, this is where we get hurt on the heifers. We're running 13% yield grade five on the heifers and 28% on, on yield grade four on the heifers. Um, and so now to our, to our premiums, uh, kind of what we're getting, I, I break our premiums down. Again, this is my just trying to understand what's going on. Our dressing premium, uh, our, our, you know, but the threshold is, is 63 and uh, 0.75, I think, on our grids. And we're always below that. So we're losing on average 26 bucks a head um, uh, for dressing premiums. That's our biggest mm -hmm. deduct by far. Are right, the choice select spread, we're making about 31 bucks a head on that, $16 a head on the certified Angus beef, uh, $24 a head on quality grade. Um, um, and then we're losing about $19 on yield grade. And then some other deducts on uh, the br bruises and dark cutters, like $2. $2 and $5 on carcass weight. So the, the big ones for us, you know, we're, we're getting good premiums on the quality and we're getting hammered on the, on, the, on the yield dressing percentage. So that's something, you know, I'd like to see us try and figure out genetically if there's something we can do, or maybe even the time we're harvesting them um, to see if we can not get hammered so, so heavily on, a, on the dressing premium. Um, so the, um, the, the other thing uh, margin wise, you know, when I look at, um, the, uh, the margins and premiums and, and try to kind of tease that out as best I can in absence of the market. You know, I think we're doing 30 or $40 better on the steers. Um, but uh, again, um, they, they to, to my view, really perform well because we've consistently made money on all our groups. Um, you know, even though we've had obviously wickedly went ranging corn prices and uh, fat cattle prices have moved around quite a bit, you know, they've all done pretty well. Um, the frustrations uh, I guess I've had um, not understanding the industry at all is um, I, I don't understand sometimes how the grids come back. Like we suddenly had a $20 deduct per head show up on some grids and it was listed under uh, uh, adjustment for settlement or something. I'm like, what, what, what is this about? I had no idea where that came from, why it was. Um, and uh, um, the uh, I think there's a prejudice in the industry against dairy cattle and I understand why and I understand you know the Holsteins from years back were, were, were problematic in a lot of ways but I really think what we're producing now is, is quite different and and I, I think we need to take a, a better look at them because you know we're not the only dairy doing this I mean this is not rocket science everybody's doing the same thing and there's going to be a lot of these dairy on beef crosses hitting the market um, or in the in the coming years and uh, I'd like to see us be able to quantify that our cattle perform well. One of the things I look at is, is the condemned livers. Um, and I don't have that on many grids. So very, very few of our lots have shown that. But thus far, we've averaged about 5% condemned livers on what we've had. Now, I don't know it, how that compares to beef animals, but I know that's been historically a problem with Holsteins. And I've you know heard numbers in the 30s and 40s percentage-wise how high they've been. But I, I really want to differentiate our cattle and create a product that can go to the packers and they can have the kind of cattle they want. And we don't have any prejudice in the marketplace in terms of how we're, we're paid for our cattle. So that's, uh, Josh, that's about all I had. Again, I'm happy to answer questions when we go. That was a real uh, quick th look through. Um, but again, overall, my messages are that we're happy with the program. We're really tickled with Tom and ABS as partners to help us through this. Um, and we're going to continue going with this program. We, we, we've been very happy with it. Great. I'm going to drop one question in here, Greg. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule, and, and I want, this will be a great opportunity to remind folks to uh, put your questions in the uh, question chat box there. 
Um, but were you uh, marketing straight dairy steers and heifers? You know that that didn't meet your uh, obviously the heifers that weren't replacements for you before. Uh, and were you retaining ownership in those, or were you selling those as calves, or what were you doing before you started crossing? We were selling our bull calves, and uh, you know we we have Jerseys and Holsteins both. So our Holstein bull calves we could sell and and get reasonable money for them. Our crossbreds were kind of hard to get rid of, maybe five or 10 bucks we'd get for them. And the jerseys, they won't even pick them up. I mean, the calf ranch won't even pick them up for free and take them. So if you come by our dairy when we've got Jersey bull calves with a pickup truck, you might leave home with 10 calves in the back of your truck. Because literally we beg neighbors to take them for free. There's, there's nothing to do with them. So you can see the quandary we had. And, and that, so we were never in the business of raising Holstein beef or taking our dairy bulls and trying to raise those and, and, uh, and uh, make a market out of those. We never did that. We just always sold them as day old. So this was a big departure from us because we had to commit a lot of dollars, um, operating dollars, to be able to have all these cattle on hand and raise them because we're retaining ownership all the way through to the end. Not, not too many dairies do that. We've elected to do that so that we could learn. You know, I felt like we have no idea what kind of product we might have in the end. And if we're going to try and market this product to, to hopefully an end user at, at some time, that again, if we can differentiate ourselves, we've got to understand what we've got. And, and collecting all this data and with Tom's help, hopefully over time, we'll have a good understanding of what we've got. And, and then we can hopefully establish a good market. I'm after just a consistent market where we're fa fairly paid for the, the kind of product that we produce. Great. Well, we didn't we didn't discuss that one ahead of time. As you mentioned, we added you to the panel a little bit later. And so uh, that was a great uh, explanation. I appreciate you sharing that very transparently. We're, we'll get into a lot more question and answer here shortly, but we're going to hand it over to uh, Blake Fouracre now to share some of his data. Well, thank you for having us, uh, Texas Tech. We've been working in this uh, beef on dairy space here, uh, I guess, since the early part of 2019. And um, I think uh, what Tom and uh, Greg presented there really really tie in nicely with, uh, with what we're going to have. We're going to start with a little bit different perspective. And so um, obviously Dr. Werner and I are, are meat scientists by training and trade. And so um, certainly the, the end product is where we start. Um, and then we're going to back up from that into to more carcass performance and, uh, and live animal performance and some of the things that we've noticed in, uh, in our research. So we'll just... Uh, Second here. So this, there we go. We'll start off um, talking about uh, an eating quality study that was uh, funded by the checkoff uh, back in 2019. And so, again, I think something to, important to, to remember here is that uh, these cattle were selected from the population at that time. But we wanted to understand, uh, based off some questions from branded programs and retailers and food service, how does the product from beef on dairy cattle uh, compare in the marketplace relative to their parental breed types, that being the, those of conventional beef cattle and, and straight bred dairy cattle, because certainly it's already been alluded to here that dairy influenced cattle or at least dairy influence has some sort of a stigma in the marketplace. So specifically related to eating quality, the traits of tenderness and, and flavor, we wanted to know where does the crossbred being 50% dairy, 50% beef fit. And then we wanted to do that um, across several different USDA quality grades, so that being prime, upper two-thirds choice, low choice, and select. So we stratified our sample collection across the three breed types and the four quality grades uh, to select our sample and understand differences in quality. So these are um, strip loin steaks that we fed to trained panelists uh, where they evaluated them for a, a myriad of traits. So these these are people that are very um, acute in their palate and uh, can, can very easily detect differences in very specific notes like fat-like and buttery that you see there on the screen. So I just pulled out a couple highlights of attributes here um, where we saw the biggest differences between those three cattle types. So first, let me preface this with, we were looking for an interaction between breed type and quality grade. That was not seen through any part portion of the study. And so therefore, all of these effects that we're presenting today are averaged over uh, marbling score. So what you're seeing is a, a true difference in, in breed type on the attributes we're talking about. So generally, we found that beef from dairy cattle uh, was rated most tender by trained panelists, whereas beef on dairy was intermediate. 
and then uh, native beef was was the lowest uh, for tenderness ratings. And then similarly, we see a, a, a trend much like that uh, for the, the positive attributes of fat-like and buttery um, on this screen. And so essentially what we're saying here is that dairy influence has a positive uh, uh, influence on those specific flavor notes. Now, as we, it, it ultimately, ultimately matters uh, when we feed those, those steaks from the same carcasses to consumers, right? And so what, what do consumers say about the product? Certainly, the consumer is not going to be having as acute of a palate as what a, a trained person might be. But when we fed those steaks from the same carcasses to consumers, uh, they found differences in tenderness uh, amongst the breed types, namely that dairy, those straight bred dairy cattle, were the most tender intermediate on beef on dairy and then lowest for native beef, similar to what our trained panelists saw, but then no difference for juiciness, flavor liking, or overall liking, other attributes that, can sit, that uh, contribute to a positive consumer eating experience. Well, not shown on this slide, I'll just add to it. Uh, when we asked consumers, was the product acceptable uh, for eating quality or not, there was no difference between any of the three breed types. Again, we, we show similar findings in uh, the, the instrumental measures of shear force, that being sliced shear force and Warner Bratzler, uh, where the beef on dairy cattle are intermediate uh, for tenderness to their parental breed types. So while the, the eating quality, the flavor, and the tenderness was a, a key finding from that study, perhaps a more important finding was the, the shelf life of those steaks from the three different cattle types. So we, again, collected strip loin steaks and then displayed them at retail for a, a certain time period until those steaks were uh, reached a point of discoloration where they were no longer marketable. So what you see here um, is time on the, the x-axis and then percentage of discoloration. That's the percentage of the, the lean area of the steak that has turned brown. You see that those the beef products from dairy cattle, straight bred dairy cattle, discolor at a much quicker rate than either of the two cattle types, and that includes beef from beef on dairy crosses. So what we see here is a, a 24 hour um, improvement in the, the, dairy, the beef from dairy influence population by, by breeding to beef, right? So it's a more sustainable practice. Those steaks um, from beef on dairy stay in the retail case um, for an additional 24 hours before they reach the 20% mark of discoloration, which has been shown in, in previous research to be the level of discoloration at which uh, consumers discriminate. You see in the top right uh, picture here, this is um, some histology work that we did at, at Texas Tech. This is actually a cellular look at uh, the meat to, for us to understand what's going on, what are, what are the phenomenon um, that can be used to help describe the differences that we saw in color and in, in tenderness and eating quality. So we're, we're quite literally looking at the, the muscle cells. And so um, what we, we found with dairy product and dairy influenced product, including the beef on dairy, is that uh, their fibers were smaller in diameter in addition to being uh, more oxidative in their metabolic type. But we won't go too deep into that today, but just realize that there's cellular mechanisms here um, to explain some of these more practical differences that we see in color and eating quality. And then finally, um, we'll, we'll end uh, concluding this study. You know, we always get asked about steak shape and steak size, particularly the middle meats coming from dairy influenced cattle, um, particularly when we're marketing those uh, either at food service uh, or at the retail setting, we've certainly all seen the images of, of those angular straight bread dairy steaks like what you see on the, the bottom left there um, that uh, are not nearly as marketable relative to uh, the other uh, cattle types. So we didn't notice a statistical or meaningful difference between uh, strip loin steaks from native beef cattle and, and beef on dairy cattle, but we did find a statistical difference uh, between those two cattle types and uh, beef from, from straight bred dairy cattle, which frankly wasn't, wasn't all that surprising. But just to kind of wrap up some, some conclusions here. So, so firstly, um, not only does dairy influence have positive implications from an eating quality standpoint in the way of improved tenderness um, and improved flavor notes of buttery and, flat and fat-like, uh, but those steaks are, are more stable uh, in retail display and they don't discolor nearly as quickly um, as dairy steaks. And then, and then beef on dairy, Crossbreds also have an advantage in terms of muscling, um, particularly within those middle meats where uh, we're not seeing the angularity and the small surface area uh, traditionally associated with straight bread dairy products. So, 
certainly found some differences uh, within that study related to eating quality. Um, and then it made us wonder, well, within this population, what are the differences? Uh, there had been a previous study um, at Colorado State uh, back in the 90s looking at Brahmin influence and um, within cattle that had equal influence of Brahmin. So say they were 50, 50 Brahmin, 50% British breeding. Uh, those cattle that looked more Brahmin ate more Brahmin, or in other words, they were tougher. So since we found differences in, in tenderness specifically and other eating quality attributes between the cattle types in the previous study, we wanted to know within the beef on dairy crossbred population, are there differences in eating quality between those cattle that look more beef-like, like you see on the left, and those cattle that look more dairy-like, like you see there on the right. So this is a study that we um, extensively worked with uh, Tom Jones at High Plains Feed Yard on. Again, this is a, a study funded a year later by the, the beef checkoff. So firstly, we categorized categorize cattle um, across nine different pens. This included six pens of steers and three pens of heifers. Uh, so a total of, of 600 cattle uh, were included in the study. Um, all came from the same dairy, so all uh, come, came from a contemporary source of, of uh, Holstein dams, and then sired by either Angus or Sim Angus sires. And there were over 20 sires represented in the study, so we were able to, to minimize that best we could any sire or, uh, or dam differences. So we had a, a three-member expert panel score every calf on the day of harvest for muscling, and frame size. And so it's a, a little bit inverse to maybe some traditional scales there. So you notice that a one for both muscling and frame size is representative of dairy type and a nine on that same scale is representative of beef type. Uh, we added those two together simply to come up with a composite visual phenotype score that ranged from two to 18. And then you can see here how we split those across those nine different pins um, there on the right, the histogram, that, that shows the, the distribution of the phenotype scores within each of the four types that we subsetted from the, the total population. So roughly 80 to 85 samples represented within each of those four, what we're going to call phenotype groups. You can see there in the middle pictures, the progression from the very dairy type or fully dairy type uh, cattle on top to the very beef-like cattle on bottom. So what does, uh, what does phenotype or the influence of beef versus dairy type um, have? What are its implications on eating quality? Um, very insignificant uh, is the answer to that question. So this is a trained sensory evaluation, again, of very, very much the same notes that we evaluated in the, the first study comparing cattle types. What you see here on the right is a plot of a combination of all of those uh, eating attributes um, between each of the four phenotype groups. And so you can see no difference um, statistically or magnitudinally uh, between any of those four groups for eating quality. Now, when we, we took those same, or stakes from those same carcasses um, and sheared them uh, to get instrumental measures of tenderness, that means slice shear force and Warner Bratzler shear force, um, again, we found no statistical difference between any of the four uh, phenotype groups. But what I would like to point out here is that when this product, or at least when these strip loin steaks were uh, aged 14 days and then frozen and then cooked, um, th those products were exceptionally tender. So I've outlined the USDA certified tender um, threshold and the USDA certified very tender threshold. Um, well over 85% of, of those steaks uh, qualified for all of those thresholds. Um, and in fact, for the, the USDA tender threshold, uh, practically 100% of them um, met that mark. So it's a very tender product, again, confirming what we found in the, the first study, that dairy influence has positive implications for tenderness. So again, um, we wanted to look at the, the size and, and shape of those stakes between phenotype groups. And so um, you can see how we did this, uh, the, the photo here on the, the right, taking an, uh, an image directly above the stake, measuring the area of the stake. And then we calculated uh, through, through measurements of width, uh, what we're gonna call the lateral stake angle, or in other words, this is the descent of the muscle from uh, the middle region to the, the end. Um, which would be a more angular, uh, would be associated with dairy products. And so 
Um, the two cattle that are pictured here on top, th those are their actual stakes that you see there on, on the right. So the one on the, uh, the steer on the left, uh, his stake is on top, and then the steer on the right is the stake on bottom. And so certainly there are differences between those two cattle, not only in weight, which would be contributing to the, the eye size differences um, between those two stakes. But uh, I would just point out that um, if we were to show either one of those two stakes by themselves, the shape of those two stakes, neither of them, um, are irregular or, or, or inappropriate uh, from a food service or retail standpoint. So certainly differences in size, but no differences in shape, uh, at least between those two cattle. Now, if we look at the larger sample group, um, what you see here on the left is, is area in, in inches squared. This is across um, stakes of, of the entire strip line. So uh, you see stake number one is the, the first stake. It's the most anterior region. And then stake number 12, would be the most posterior strip loin steak that we get from that carcass. So steak number 12 would be closer to the, the sirloin region for anatomical reference. And so there was no statistical difference between any four of the phenotype groups in, in steak area, although we do see some, some slight numerical trends there, those red bars representing the beef type cattle and the black bars representing the, the dairy type cattle. But I would just point out magnitudinally the scale of those differences, if you, um, you know, center yourself back to the, the scale there on the, the left axis, um, there's no more than a, uh, a half inch difference really between uh, those phenotype groups uh, and certainly not more than an inch. And so um, it begs the question, is there is there really a difference in eye size uh, between these cattle types? Do muscling differences lie elsewhere? We're going to talk about that in the next couple of slides. And then you see that lateral stake angle presented there um, on the right, no difference in angularity of, of strip line stakes. Uh, between any of these phenotype groups. So that's really interesting to us um, because certainly the cattle were, were very different live. And so you see that here, the live muscling score between, between the four phenotype groups by design was very different, um, at least uh, in, in, in reference to the, the scale system that we set up. So certainly there were muscle differences within the live cattle as evaluated by the expert evaluators. But uh, but we didn't see any difference in the in the strip loin stakes what we just showed that measured and then no difference in ribeye area either. Um, so certainly maybe a numerical trend from fully dairy type to fully beef type, but magnitudinally uh, not more than four tenths of an inch difference. Now where where was the difference? Uh, so we also scored round muscling around conformation once those cattle arrived to the packing facility. And so that was also on the one to nine point scale where one is lightest muscle and nine is heaviest muscle. And that's where you see the difference in muscling appears to lie. So while no difference in ribeye area, it seemed that those cattle that were more beef type in appearance were depositing a, a greater proportion of their muscle in the, the form of their round, um, as opposed to those cattle that uh, were, were fully dairy type in phenotype. And so just out of curiosity, I, I wanted to, to understand how, how well can we predict that round muscling score um, with some of these other metrics uh, included in the study. So on the bottom left there, you see the live muscling score. That's again, the score called by the evaluators on the date of harvest um, and its ability to predict round muscling. So you see a relatively a uh, strong relationship there and, and a magnitudinally more positive one um, than what you see in ribeye area in predicting the same round muscling score there on the right. And again, these are, are after adjusting for any effects of pins. So all of these treatments were blocked within each of those nine pins. And then we also adjusted these values to a, a constant hot carcass weight in the study of 894 pounds. So certainly um, th that study found that, uh, that the cattle that, um, that we made to, to be more beef type, certainly that's not going to have any negative implications on eating quality. And it found that perhaps ribeye area is not a great predictor, predictor of total saleable muscle weight or, or, or total saleable yield from that carcass. And certainly with the dairy influence, that seems to be a focus um, that I don't think we're ever going to be able to get away from uh, because those cattle are, are so light muscled. Um, and that's why traditionally dairy has, the, the term dairy at least, has had a negative connotation in the beef industry for all the things that Greg talked about with dressing percentage and, and, uh, and muscle yield. But 
we wanted to know then um, what is the relationship between ribeye area and, and total carcass muscle weight? And what's its ability to predict that? Uh, so this is a, a separate study here. This is a, a carcass cutout comparison. Uh, we included several different breed types, but uh, a predominance of, of beef on dairy cattle in addition to the, the parental breed types there. So a large range in, uh, in carcass cutout and large range in, in musculature um, within that, that sample. So what you can see, um, on the bottom right, there is ribeye area after adjusting to a constant side weight and constant bone weight. Um, ribeye area's ability to predict total carcass muscle weight. Um, and you can see that uh, it's, it's not great, right? It's somewhat similar to what we had seen on the, the previous slide in ribeye area's ability to predict round muscling. So certainly a positive direction, but if we look more specifically at, at round muscle weight there on the left-hand side, you see that the... Uh, uh, the direction, not only is it more positive, but the strength of that relationship is much more positive. And so that's suggesting that perhaps there's other muscle regions within a carcass that if we want to improve carcass muscle weight within uh, some of these cattle types, particularly those that are inferiorly muscled, like those with dairy influence, we might be needing to look outside of certain metrics like ribeye area. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is in, in today's industry, if we talk about tools to measure that, to improve uh, total carcass muscle weight, um, really ribeye area is the best that we have at this point. And so um, certainly the, the consideration of additional metrics and, and even just looking at the cattle, um, you know, if, if you're a dairy looking to select what kinds of bulls might be important if I'm um, trying to increase saleable muscle yield out of a carcass, Traits that might be important, um, in addition to ribeye area, I might be looking at the cattle, physically looking at the, the musculature of the hind quarter. So certainly dairy influence seems to be um, a problem for muscularity and saleable yield, and that's a major concern um, expressed by the packers as well. We're going to shift gears here. So, so again, firstly, um, muscling is a problem in the industry for these cattle, and, then, and secondarily, liver abscesses um, are another considerable problem. So up here on the, the top left, just to orient yourself, this, these are just uh, some survey data that we collected in a plant. These are roughly 1,200 beef on dairy crosses. We wanted to know just what's, what's kind of an industry average or what's a target um, for liver spores. And so generally what we found is that uh, just over 30% of those beef on dairy crosses um, had some sort of uh, liver abscess or, or diseased liver condition. Um, and then you can see some affiliations there with gut pile condemnation and additional losses associated with outside skirts. And then I'll, I'll reference you to the, the bottom here. Um, and these are our data from the phenotype study where not only did we track whether the, the, the cattle had a liver abscess or not, but we also tracked what was the, the implications on skirt damage. Certainly we know that in cattle that have severe liver abscesses that requires additional trimming of that outside skirt muscle, which is a very valuable muscle, which we'll talk about here in a second. But we wanted to know if we stratified those cattle by no liver abscess versus liver abscess, and then within those subcategories, stratified by no skirt damage versus skirt damage, what were its implications on uh, metrics of dressing percentage and marbling score, two things that are very important to pay producers on. And you can see here, um, well, firstly, there's, there's an 8% uh, of those cattle ha could be attributed to, to skirt damage with no liver abscess. I would just uh, chalk that up to uh, either workmanship at the plant um, or measurement error um, in, in, uh, in measuring those cattle. So, but roughly a very low percentage of those cattle fell within that, that category. But as you can see on either end of that, a, a good proportion of cattle in, in each of those other three categories, and that's where I want to focus my emphasis here, to look at dressing percentage between those cattle that had no skirt damage and no liver abscess, and, and dressing percentage between those cattle that had no skirt damage and a liver abscess compared to cattle that had a skirt damage and had a liver abscess, or presumably very poor gut health. There's a uh, roughly uh, 0 0.7 to 1% difference in dressing percentage uh, between those cattle and that those cattle that had skirts that had to be trimmed, presumably as a result of liver abscess, dressed quite lower. See a similar trend in marbling score that those cattle that were diseased um, and, and resulted in skirt damage also had roughly a 10 to 15 point 
uh, lower marbling score. So what's that ultimately mean if we have to trim an outside skirt uh, from a, a carcass, a beef on dairy carcass, because it was severely uh, liver abscessed and, and caused an adhesion uh, to that diaphragm muscle? Well, up to $50 per animal. So significant implications and considerations there relative to liver abscess. I don't think that this stops with uh, the dairy influence. Yeah, liver abscesses are an industry-wide problem, certainly more prevalent in the dairy population, but um, add to uh, considerations that, that we need to look at moving forward within this group. So that's all I've got. Um, I'll let you guys take over for questions. All right, we have a lot of questions uh, coming in here. Starting kind of with the basics, there was a question about, can you just kind of explain the basics of grid-based marketing? I, I know we have a lot of students and a lot of cow-calf producers uh, and maybe dairy producers that, to your point, Greg, have never really uh, been in the beef, beef business. So they would just like a basic explanation of, of the grid. So on, on our grid marketing or formula programs that we have, basically what we're doing is, is uh, putting a putting a value on an animal, uh, on, on a steer or a heifer, using the carcass merits to do it. And uh, we will get a deduction on there for, for heavy weights and things like that and light weights as well. But it's basically, you know, we're looking at a choice select spread. We're looking at a prime spread. So the base level will be a select uh, a stake or a select a, a carcass. And then uh, I think that choice spread now is three or $4. I'm not sure what the prime is today. I haven't looked for a couple of days. So uh, and 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 one and so that's that's big drivers of what the value of the carcass is going to be. And another one, like Greg is talking about, and 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 we can discuss this all day long, is dressing percentage. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, what the value of dressing percentage is. And this is just my opinion. Dressing percentage was something that we used back in the old days when we were buying all our cattle live, and uh, it was uh, it was a, a it was, uh, we might have had some producers that would, were pretty good at filling their cattle up before they went into a packing plant. So, um, uh, and that's, that's just part of the reason why, why dressing percentages were meant to be something, but, but we're basically, you're getting paid for the type of animal that you're, that you're, uh, that a retailer is going to, going to use and, and, and can merchandise. If you can merchandise it, there's more value to it, then you're going to get paid more for your, for your, for your, for your, for your steer. I kind of, at least being back from cow calf country, I always start with the basics. So you, they kind of you look for an average steer. I think right now maybe that's a, a yield grade three uh, choice, you know, low choice. And then if that's the basics, then you to Tom's point, you either add to or take away, and based on what you're uh, you're looking at. So uh, I, and I would encourage you just to do a quick Google on there. There's a lot of great extension documents uh, out there that explain it very well from from some of our cattle feeding states. Um, lots of questions for, uh, for Greg, and you answered uh, some as you went, but um, questions uh, probably for both Greg and Tom, uh, because I feel like Blake answered this a little bit, but Greg, one specific question was that what sire uh, breeds are you using on the beef side? Are they you mentioned the new eras did tom but maybe guys just explain a little bit about what you know about the genetics of those bulls yeah so we're i guess i didn't explain that we're using sim angus cyrus from, from the in focus program and uh that you know i think the simmental influence probably helps because we're not pure holstein uh you know holstein cattle obviously frame size is so big we're the jersey holstein cross and so adding a little frame to there probably a good thing um but they They've really done well for us, but it's a Sim Angus through ABS and folks program is all we've used. Tom, is that from from your experience, what you've been feeding out uh, with other clients? Is that similar or other breeds involved that folks have had any success with? We've done some uh, we've done some testing on some on some other breeds and 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 different uh, obviously different types of sires on these things over the last several years and. Uh, I, I think I think we're getting the growth on these carcasses, and, and we're, we're getting some shape. You know, we're, we're, that the, the shape of that uh, that strip steak and and the shape of the of the ribeye and things like that is 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 critical. And uh, that might be a question for Blake or Dale to answer. But I but I think I think using the Sim Angus is we're getting we're getting 
we're getting some extra mileage out of that. I also think that, you know, when we go Sam Angus on them, we're going to get uh, have a better chance to have a little bit uh, uh, less degree of fat on the cattle as well with more frame on the cattle. Yeah, I think uh, the message is is really composite breeds work well. Complementarity of Angus cattle for marbling ability, of course, and then Continental sires as a whole, whether they're Simmental, Limousine, others could be added to the list to to address those red meat yield issues. Um, are all very positive. Of course, the symmetry and the round shape of the ribeye or strip loin is very important as well. But uh, I think Blake would tell you. Uh, I know he'll tell you. But it's not about breed, it's about individual bulls. And, uh, you know, there's great bulls within the purebred operations of Angus and others. Uh, and there's a lot of really great bulls that are, are crossbreds. And it really comes down to uh, their ability, not only their phenotype, but their ability to pass that on to offspring. And, and it's really about selecting individual bulls. And, and that's what these bull studs are doing, right? ABS. Uh, select sires, Gen X, and others, not to leave any of them out, but anyone that has a program dedicated to this particular uh, concept is trying to balance all of those traits with purebreds and composite breeds. I'd just add to that, um, you know, the beauty of this scenario, uh, even relative to the, the beef side of things, and it sounds like Greg's already doing this, so I mean, one of the, the more progressive dairy guys, um, retaining ownership is huge and getting data back on those cattle is huge. So the, 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 our ability to use artificial insemination within the dairy industry almost exclusively um, and, and be able to track the performance of progeny from certain specific bulls is huge. And so um, I think as we move forward in 2022, we're going to see a lot more opportunities for retained ownership, a lot more uh, tracking of data and a lot more genetic improvement on the sire selection side. Yeah, and I think we're not unique in that way as, as a dairy that we're, we're set up to be able to keep that data. It's really no extra work and, and to keep track of sires and, and, and performance and whatnot. It's a lot easier for us to do than a cow-calf producer. Greg, I've got two for you that I'll let you, we'll stage in here real quick. One, hope might be simple, uh, question about, it must be, I'm assuming from someone in the dairy business asking about gestation length with those beef sires versus the dairy. Have you seen a difference there and, and what's the practical outcome of that? You know, I, I've been meaning to check that. So I, I don't want to say yes or no, because I haven't actually checked the numbers. There's been nothing noticeable. There has been absolutely no calving problems. Our DOAs have st stayed the same. You know, we, we run about a 2% DOA rate, so we don't have problems with it, but we've had no problems uh, calving them. At. Now, it's important to note that we use sex semen on our heifers and we use beef semen in our cows. So we have not had a lot of heifers cab with beef semen. We've had a few and not had any problems, but they just, they spit them out, no problem at all. I haven't had any issues. Um, I know I've heard the thing about gestation length being different a little bit, and I, I just can't answer what ours are is because I haven't looked at it. I'll, I'll just add to, to that, Greg. Um, early on, we did some uh, preliminary kind of pilot macro level research uh, at, at the dairy level. So we were able to, to capture uh, records from dairy comp uh, to try to understand what were the, the differences between cows within the same dairy uh, being bred to, to beef semen versus dairy semen. Uh, so the answer to the, the gestation link question for that research was two days in the sense that uh, those cattle that were, were bred to beef semen had a two day longer gestation length, which we've been told from the dairy guys is, is somewhat negligible um, relative to, to dairy semen. Uh, so the same, to the same token, those that say it's negligible, there is a group that says it's really important. And some of these bull studs are starting now to look at sires with shorter gestation lengths on the beef side. Of course, we know that also correlates pretty well with low birth weights and calving ease bulls. Um, you know, there's issues, of course, selecting for early gestation or short gestation with performance and size. So I'm sure this is something that uh, the genomics and geneticists guys are tippy-toeing around. But like Blake said, two days on average may be pretty, pretty negligible, but has gotten enough attention for these bull studs to start paying a little of attention in terms of EPDs or genetic predictors for it. I'm going to hit Tom up with one, and then we'll come back to you, Greg, on the one that I was going to tag team. Uh, Tom, a question about rations, and have you experimented with or changed rations for the dairy 
or dairy cross cattle versus conventional beef, or you guys see pretty much the same uh, rations across those breed compositions? The, the rations don't differ across the yard, uh, Josh. Um, uh, I mean, the only thing is, is a lot of times when uh, these dairies will start bringing some of these uh, calves in at the 350 pound range, why we typically just have them gaining on a, on, on a, uh, a mid-level starter ration, just one up from, a, from, a, from the start ration. And uh, we'll keep them on that till they hit about 700 pounds, and then we'll go ahead and, and uh, put them on full feed. But the, the, the ration uh, is the same. Really appreciate all the questions coming in uh, from a great audience here of almost 200 folks tonight. Uh, we will, I will share these questions with the appropriate presenters and we'll get you some emailed responses. Uh, we do have your email attached to your question. So if we don't get to you, uh, feel free to go ahead and send them in and we'll try to get you answers over the next week or so. And a reminder that this uh, is recorded. So some of you I know jumped on late. You might not have heard Tom's presentation. I'm not going to ask questions that he answered during his presentation. I would ask you to go back and check out the first part of the presentation. Uh, back to Greg, uh, a question about you talked about uh, early on you were selling or giving away the Jersey calves, selling the the Holstein calves at birth. What made you decide when you switch to beef crosses to retain ownership instead of just selling? We have heard, you know, from some dairies that are using beef crosses, but the value is also realized with a higher price calf, you know, earlier in life that they that they pass on to a calf ranch early and and don't retain ownership on on those calves. So what made the decision there for you or, or How'd you make that decision? Yeah, the decision was just to, as I said, to be able to understand what we had so we could monetize it appropriately or, or maximize. Um, you know, we're, we're doing this to make money. Um, and if, if you don't know what you have, how can you sit there and say, gosh, should we sell them at birth? Should we sell them as feeders? Should we take them all the way to the end? And, you know, I don't know if the answer is we make the most money taking them all, all the way. Is it worth it taking them all the way to the end? Well, it appears like sometimes yes, sometimes maybe not. But at least now with enough data, we'll know what we have. I still think long-term our vision is to be able to market a product and have a consistent supply in the marketplace. And that every, you know, we can go to a packer or a customer and say, we can bring you the same, you know, a thousand of these eventually as we grow every week or every two weeks, the same kind of cattle every week, week in and week out. It never changes. It's always the same. I just think there's value in that and it differentiates yourself. And it's just like, uh, you know, I've learned in the dairy business, we can't just build a dairy and, and hope somebody buys our milk. We've got to have a market. We've got to have a contract. And the, and the beef, it strikes me as the same way. I can't just raise cattle and, and show up at a packing plant and say, say, buy my cattle. And so you've got to have market access. So we're trying to differentiate ourselves by having a product from beginning to the end. And I, I won't say branded. I mean, I kind of think branded, but not have a, a High Plains Ponderosa brand on the side of the animal or something, but just that when our cattle go, the packer knows who they are. Like, yeah, they're good cattle. We know what we're getting and we want to buy those. You know, I want packers coming to, to Tom's yard and say, we want those high plains cattle. They're the ones we want to buy. And if we get that, we've got market access. So I just see that as a, as a win-win for us long-term. So that's why we decided to keep them all the way through just so we can make better informed decisions to monetize this as best we can. Tom, do you have any experience feeding Charlay Cross? There's a specific question about that. There's some data, uh, I think, from some other other parts of the country where they're they're feeding out some Charlay Cross, and just they were just curious if you had had any experience with those and how they did. I, I don't have any firsthand experience on them, uh, but the ABS people have shown me some data on them, and uh, some of that stuff that we're looking that they showed me looks promising on the Charlay cat. Yeah, similar back to Dale's response on the composites and adding those uh, some of those Angus uh, and Continental composites seem to work really well. Greg, speaking of that breed composition again, we've got a lot of questions around that here from uh, from both dairy and beef folks. I think um, are you spending a lot of time on sire selection, or are you relying on a consultant or or ABS to help you with that? Are you trying a lot of different sires or are you finding a couple that you like and sticking with them? What's your approach there? Yeah, so first of all, I'm not a genetics guy. And uh, so either on the dairy or the beef end, but I can say this, I think genetics makes a bigger difference in this application than it does on the dairy side. I think genetics is key to making this program work. And so we've, we use very few sires. I just look at the sire, I mean, you know, very, very few sires that we're using. 
and ABS is basically selecting them for us. You know, we're not, I don't know that we even know what to select for. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, Dale kind of alluded to that earlier about what are the bull studs doing to, and we, this, these are questions we've been asking, like, how are you choosing these, these sires? You know, on the dairy side, we'd say, we want to choose a sire that produces daughters that milk better, that are healthier and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, what we're after here is we want sires that, that, that produce calves that finish the way we want and have the performance characteristics that we want given a dairy beef application. And, and that's supposedly what's happening. And we're trying to, in the process of having a, a little tighter relationship with ABS so we can understand a little more and know a little better so we make better decisions. But I don't think we know enough on the dairy end to even look, I don't even know what the heck we look at because the traditional things I think you'd look at in selecting a beef sire is not necessarily what we're looking at. True, Josh, you know, across the board, dairies are allowing for the bull studs or genetics providers to make the decisions uh, with their cows and individual matings. Uh, obviously, because of the focus of programs uh, across multiple bull studs, that's been a very good thing of late. It was a very bad thing uh, four or five years ago, perhaps, when they were just cleaning out inventories of really low-performing bulls. But that certainly has changed a lot. And luckily, you know, Greg, for you and others, there's enough competition in this space now that these bull studs are, are trying to do a better job to make better cattle. And I think it's, you know, pretty good policy to trust them in making those decisions. Uh, I can tell you, we've, uh, we've talked more than just uh, ABS on this and they are most, there's most definitely a lot of bull studs out there that are putting a lot of effort for it. Dale. I totally agree that it's not just one company that's doing it. There's a lot of companies that I think are really putting some effort for it here. There's a question, a couple of questions around sourcing these type of cattle to feed, uh, if if a feed yard wants to do that. So I know some of the uh, some of the aforementioned, you know, semen companies are are trying to help connect the dots. I think to some of these cattle and add some value. Um, obviously, going to uh, to co-ops and finding out where those larger dairies are that might be utilizing this might be another option. I don't know if anybody has any suggestions on that sourcing those kind of cattle. I, I think uh, I think Superior has uh, has some uh, has some dairies that have been marketing cattle through that thing, Josh, and uh, and and I and I think uh, I think that's probably the if a guy wants to get uh, any volume, they can look at it that way. There's several people out in California that are doing the same thing too. A lot of dairies out in that part of the state that you know are making some pretty nice cattle and you know, sending them our way. You know, it would, I would call one of these genetics companies, I guess, and and say, hey, where can I find some good cattle? We're going to wind this thing down here in a minute, uh, Greg. We're going to be sending you quite a few email <laughs> questions because we do have a lot for you. Uh, one is uh, that that a lot of folks may find interesting. What's your semen cost differential between just sourcing dairy semen for your replacements versus the beef semen? Well, it's, it's the same price as traditional dairy semen. It's a lot cheaper than sex. So I, I won't say what the price is, but it's the same as if I use non-sex dairy semen. Great. So that's not a big differentiator for you in that decision making even cost has nothing i guess i'll just throw out a soft softball here and and you know obviously this has been a, a lot of information from the different participants and then all these questions coming in any any closing thoughts from any of the panelists and we'll just wrap things up tonight i think uh you know everyone on the panel had good discussion about emphasis on quality grade and we understand very well that these cattle perform exceptionally well from a beef quality standpoint. Um, the opportunities for improvement are balancing that quality grade with uh, improving conformation and specifically muscularity in these cattle. Uh, that's a direction that we need to be headed in this industry. And then, you know, the elephant in the room, of course, are the discounts associated with liver abscess. You know, we've got to really get a hold of that issue. Uh, maybe there's a middle ground between feeding towards prime and choice percentage and, and at the same time avoiding some of those big issues uh, with additional days on feed contributing to liver abscess problems. So uh, major disparity, as Blake showed, between traditional measures of muscling on carcass, which is ribeye area, and what the actual muscularity of the cattle are. So I think you're going to see a movement or should see a movement 
uh, against single trait selection of ribeye area, not only in beef on dairy, but across the board in beef cattle. Uh, I think this issue exaggerates itself quite a lot in this particular model, where ribeye area is not a necessarily a good indicator of total carcass muscularity. And we need to start looking at confirmation scores, take a better look at phenotype, and, and the beef industry needs to take a look at measuring carcass confirmation and total muscularity so that it can send the appropriate signal back up the chain for what true muscle is. And uh, so I think, you know, predictor here is that we're gonna start to see a lot of movement towards carcass confirmation measurement, carcass confirmation uh, selection, and that's where the industry needs to go. So Josh, the only thing I'll add is, um, you know, we've talked about liver abscesses and that, like you said, that's a red elephant in the room that, that uh, I know it's a, I've seen videos and when they, back in the days of the Holsteins and it, it wasn't good. And uh, what I wanna, as a dairyman, I've been asking from day one, well, what should we do? Should we feed a hotter ration to have fewer days on feed or feed not so hot and have longer days on feed, which is gonna create liver ab abscess? And everyone's like, I don't know. And so what, what should we feed anything else in our diet? I don't know, No, there, there's nothing known. So I think we need research. Um, so then on the dairy end, we know better what we're doing because we're stumbling around here throwing rations at cattle. We don't know what we're doing. And it's a different type of animal. So I really think we can get there as an industry. We want to produce the right kind of cattle that the market needs. And if there's a financial incentive, you know, a deduct or a premium to be had or whatever, we're going to go after the dollars, no doubt about it. And so we just, uh, we've got the ability to do what we want to do it as an industry. We just need direction on where to go because we really don't know. We're, uh, we're putting a group together now, Greg, on, on a, a designing a trial to see what's going on in these liver abscesses. And, and uh, to your to your point, you know, how much energy and at what time are we throwing at them? What's causing, you know, we don't know for sure, like they all say. But yeah, they're, we're, we're, we're putting, we're trying to get that put together now. Great. Well, great challenge to, uh, to both the participants on the, uh, the panelists, uh, Dale, and to, to us as industry leaders at NCBA and our volunteer leadership, as well as just all those folks on online. I know we've got a lot of uh, of industry leaders listening in. So thanks for that. And uh, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Thanks again to our panel and for all the participants sending in questions and for sticking with us through uh, a little bit longer webinar. And I uh, hope you all have a great night and we'll uh, see you on the next webinar. Thanks everybody.